Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Triple N Media. I am Dr. Nick Nickham, a cardiologist who has been practicing in the Houston area for more than 40 years. The feature presentation is ACC AHA 2018 Guidelines for AV Blocks with Associated Bradycardia. So let us begin with the main presentation. This presentation is based on this uh, 2018 ACC AHA HRS guidelines uh, published uh, in the American Journal of Cardiology and uh, we are going to look in depth as how we manage uh, bradycardia, symptomatic bradycardia associated with various types of uh, AV blocks. You can follow my green arrow here. Here's a complex uh, flowchart that uh, is provided in this article. And in fact, you can download this article. Just Google this title and you can download this PDF for your reference uh, for future uh, use. So this is an excellent flowchart. It looks very complex and intriguing, but in reality, what I'm going to do is break this into part A and part B, the part A at the top and part B at the bottom, and try to understand the concept behind what the recommendations are. Once we understand the concepts, it becomes very easy to decide what we need to do in a given circumstance. At the end of this presentation, you realize there are certain things which we thought would never need a given particular treatment. However, when you look at this chart, it will tell you, but there are indications for a different kind of treatment based upon the overall clinical presentation and the symptomatology. So let us begin with part one. Part one, we are talking about AV block. When we talk about AV block, what are we actually referring to? We are talking about the first degree AV block, which most of us are familiar with. It's, we are talking about the Mobitz type 1 or Mobitz type 2 AV block. And of course, uh, high grade AV block or complete heart block. So we are at all these extremes, you know, a benign first degree AV block, and at the other extreme, we have somebody with a complete uh, heart block or Mobitz type 2 with evidence of infranodal block. It is pretty obvious if someone has a complete heart block or a Mobitz type 2 with infranodal AV block as established by EP studies or some other means, uh, then the treatment is permanent pacemaker. It's a class 1 indication. So these are all questions which may be asked on your board so just keep this in mind. So let us start off with the most benign condition that is the first degree AV block. So often we read electrocardiograms uh, that have first degree AV block maybe 220 milliseconds, 230 milliseconds or maybe 240 milliseconds. When would we consider a AV block as significant? If the AV block is greater than 240 milliseconds, and particularly if the PR interval is uh, greater than 300 milliseconds, then atrioventricular synchronization becomes uh, an issue which can lead to reduced cardiac output and symptoms. Anyway, if someone has marked AV blockade, before we do anything, of course, we take a complete history we take a full we do a complete physical examination and the first thing we need to do is the slow heart rate or any evidence of heart blocks are they related to any reversible causes like lyme myocarditis which can be cured with antibiotics and the heart blocks may disappear we are, are we dealing with patient with a beta blocker calcium channel blocker or digoxin in sleep apnea, you see significant degrees of AV blocks, which may resolve with uh, treatment of sleep apnea. In acute myocardial infarctions, like patients with uh, inferior myocardial infarction who develop uh, significant bradycardia or bradyarrhythmias. Then electrolyte imbalances, like in patients with kidney failure, with severe hyperkalemia. And again, in sleep, 
people may have very slow heart rate due to vagal tone which is a normal phenomenon and finally if we are dealing with a patient with a coronary artery disease uh, before we decide well this is uh, something that needs to be fixed with a pacemaker we need to rule out myocardial ischemia so all these things need to be taken into account so bradycardia is not an isolated incidence in the presence of av block this should be taken in the context of the patient's overall presentation in addition to that, just a 12-lead electrocardiogram can give you a lot of information about what the underlying condition of the entire electrical system in the heart is. For example, if the QRS is narrow, then the blockade is uh, in the AV node. Or if you're dealing with a bundle branch block, or if you have a wide QRS from 110 to 150 milliseconds or a very wide QRS like 150 milliseconds. So all these things indicate the location of the AV block plus also the status of the distal bundle branch blocks and the myocardial tissue itself. In patients with severe scarring myocardial uh, cardiomyopathy, they may have like wide QRS complexes with more than 150 millisecond QRS intervals. So anyway, so let's get back to first degree AV block. If they have no symptoms, then we need to look for any evidence of uh, neuromuscular diseases that can cause first degree AV block. If they have no neuromuscular conditions, we just need to observe these patients. Putting a pacemaker in these patients is harmful. So this is anything that is in red, you need to know because that could be a bold question for you. Okay, if this is related to neuromuscular conditions, then maybe these patients can get a permanent pacemaker. Now coming back to if you have a person with a significant uh, first degree AV block, like PR intervals greater than 240 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds, uh, and they are having symptoms, uh, they may be a candidate class two, one indication for a permanent pacemaker. Again, these patients with the neuromuscular disorders, uh, if they have Lyme AC, you can go. If they don't have, if they have neuromuscular diseases, uh, which is sort of chronic and permanent, then they may be, this may be 2B indication for a pacemaker. So let us look at Mobitz type 1 block. Mobitz type 1 block is the Wenckebach type, which most of us think to be benign. However, it is not the case in all patients. If they are having no symptoms, and if we exclude these neuromuscular conditions, uh, uh, then we can observe these patients. If they are having Mobitz type 1, just like first degree AV block, and they have neuromuscular conditions, uh, then they can be a class 1 indication for a pacemaker. If these patients are having symptoms, Mobitz type 1 block, because as I said, it is unusual to just see an isolated Mobitz type 1 block with no other associated conditions like the patient may have coronary artery disease, they may have myocardial disease, they may have bundle branch blocks, they may have wide QRS complex. When we put all these things together and on top of that, if they are having symptoms, then a permanent pacing is a class 2A indication. And as I said here, if they do not have any neuromuscular conditions, uh, then we can just wash them pacemaker is a contraindication in these patients. Whenever we are dealing with patients with uh, significant bradycardia in the presence of AV blocks of varying degrees, uh, one of the things that we need to be concerned is uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And that may be one of the reasons where we may want to put a pacemaker to minimize, to stabilize the rhythm to regulate the rhythm and reduce these ventricular ectopic beats which are counterproductive to the cardiac output. Now let's look at part B. This is where we stopped in the previous slide, ventricular arrhythmia. Cardiac resynchronization therapy candidate because of heart failure symptoms and left ventricular ejection fraction. So if we have someone with 
cardiac failure like with reduced ejection fraction and uh, they have uh, a need for a CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy then we should proceed along that route it says guideline directed medical therapy it should be a guideline directed therapy because uh, putting a CRT is not a medical treatment if that is not the case if someone needs infrequent pacing and this can be determined by using event monitors for 30 days or 60 days or loop recorders to see how often would this patient need the requirement of a pacemaker if it is like 10 percent or 20 percent and so if the frequency is insignificant we can just put a single chamber ventricular pacing lead which is VBI. And the next thing is, if someone has permanent atrial fibrillation, then a single chamber ventricular pacing could be considered. But let's keep in mind, patients with atrial fibrillation have no atrial activity. So putting an atrial lead would be redundant because it's not going to serve any purpose. It's just going to make things more complicated. Okay, if the patient does not have atrial fibrillation, then we can consider a dual chamber pacing which is a class 1 indication so that we can maintain the atrioventricular synchrony to improve the cardiac output. If the ejection fraction is uh, greater than 50 percent, yes right ventricular pacing lead is a class 2a indication. The predicted pacing is greater less than 40 percent then we can do uh, just right ventricular pacing. However when we just pace the right ventricle. Remember there is a dyssynchrony between the right ventricular activation and the left ventricular activation and eventually these patients may develop pacemaker related heart failure. So that is something to keep in mind especially if they have rapid heartbeats in between pacing intervals. Pacing to maintain physiologic left ventricular activation. There are two ways this can be accomplished either by CRT or more recently or more recently the, uh, the EP experts are using the His bundle pacing which basically activates the His bundle just before the origin of the right and the left bundle branches. As a result it activates the right ventricle and the left ventricle simultaneously. So we have synchrony of both the ventricles during contraction. So these patients uh, very much function like patients who have CRT and, and the technique is a little, little more challenging but in, in the hands of experts uh, it has been found to be quite useful with significant improvement in the cardiac output uh, when patients are paced through the His bundle. Anyway, let's talk about a little bit about uh, management of conduction disorder algorithms. Conduction disorders like bundle branch block, fascicular blocks with one-to-one -one AV conduction. So often we see patients with uh, left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block or maybe a combination of first degree AV block and a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block. They may have one-to-one -one AV conduction but if they are having symptoms like uh, syncope or if their HV interval on EP study is greater than 70 milliseconds uh, then they are a candidate for a permanent pacing. If they don't have symptoms and if they don't have this uh, prolonged HV interval if they are having alternating bundle branch block suggesting they have disease in both the right and the left bundle branch bundle branches then permanent pacing is a class 1 indication. Remember alternating bundle branch blocks even in the absence of symptoms is a class 1 indication and this could be a very good class question. <laughs> if someone has a left ventricular rejection fraction between 36 and 50 percent in the presence of left bundle branch block or a QRS greater than 150 milliseconds and class 2 or greater heart failure. Now we are talking about a classic heart failure patients with a reduced ejection fraction, bundle branch block, wide QRS complex 
which is suggestive of myocardial disease and Purkinje system disease, cardiac resynchronization therapy is a class 2B indication, surprisingly. <clears throat> Symptoms are suggestive of intermittent AV block. If they are yes, then we need to look at AV block diagnostic algorithm, which we talked about just previously. Otherwise, we just observe these patients. So, ladies and gentlemen, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this uh, brief presentation on bradycardia associated with various types of AV blocks, namely the first degree AV block, second degree Wenke block, and Mobitz type two block, and high grade or complete heart block, and how we evaluate these patients, and how we look for associated conditions in terms of uh, electrical activity, myocardial activity, and any reversible causes like drugs and infections or ischemia and how we decide what is the most appropriate treatment for these patients. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. We have a series of presentations on ACC AHA guidelines on heart failure, ischemic heart disease, chest pain evaluation, coronary interventions, coronary artery bypass surgery and many others and please do watch them and if you want me to review uh, any other chapter on ACC AHA guidelines and prepare a more simplistic approach to how we manage these patients at bedside please leave us a comment below and I will be more than happy to do the research and produce a video. Thank you so much for your support.